Shabbat Shalom. If you are living in any overlapping echo chambers that I am, on whatever media you consume, like me, you'll see almost daily when I turn on whatever device, I read about another person who's resigning, another person who's leaving, another person who's been fired um, for their misconduct. And the question of how we best create safe and equal environments wherever we are is an important one and one that we will talk about another time and have spoken about already. But a, a few pieces caught my eye this week um, about one began, what are we going to do now that the face of politics and entertainment have been, has been changed because of these moguls who are being ousted? And then a few response pieces saying, well, you know that there's people who work for those people and there's hundreds of people that went into the work that everyone does or did. And so to say that the exit of you know, however many high profile individuals is going to completely change the face of the game is somewhat inaccurate. But what was interesting to me is this, it pointed to the way in which we treat mostly male, but these sort of alphas in our society, these, these people who are heroic, who are geniuses, who are game changers, who are whatever it is, and the way that we sort of pin all of whatever happens in their world on the shoulders of one person. And it's something that happens in this week's Parsha as well. Because Joseph shows up to the Pharaoh. Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh doesn't know what that dream means. Pharaoh needs a specialist. He needs someone who can interpret dreams. And his butler says, oh, I know a guy from jail. Go get Joseph. So he finds Joseph and he says, Joseph, I have these dreams. Can you tell me what they mean? Joseph interprets the dreams, says there's going to be seven years of famine, seven years of plenty, and you know, you're going to need someone to, to help you run the kingdom with this. And Pharaoh says, oh, that's great. And then immediately hands over the reins of his kingdom to Joseph, which is shocking. Right? And Yitzchak Abarbanel, one of our Portuguese commentaries, a great commentator on the Torah, he asks this very question. He says, excuse me, Pharaoh, you just met this guy. He's, he's in jail. And you're going to say, oh no, you run the whole show for me, please. And Abarbanel answers his question. He says, well, what Pharaoh assumed was if Joseph is brilliant enough and holy enough to know what these dreams mean, then he's got to be the Ish Navon V'chacham, this wise and understanding person. I'm sure he'll do a great job with the country as well. And he hands over the kingdom. Now, interestingly, in that moment, Joseph tries to argue against this hero cult, against putting it all on him. And Joseph says, you're going to need a top person but Joseph also tells Pharaoh, you're going to need these pikidim, these, um, these guards, these magistrates, these uh, officers. You're going to need other people to help you. But the Torah doesn't tell us anything about them. Pharaoh just says, no, Joe, you're the guy. Here you go. Let me know if you have any trouble. And he turns it over. And it, it's almost in that moment the Torah was trying to teach us something about leadership, and we, or we as in the Pharaoh, we don't get it. No, we want just one person who's going to take care of everything. And we don't learn our lesson when Joseph is gone, and what's the problem with this kind of leadership? There arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. The system wasn't sustainable, and we end up into slavery. We get out of slavery, and what do we do? We find a new guy, Moses. Oh, Moses, he's going to take care of everything for us. And we just follow Moses in all that we do. We rely on him so much so that Moses is gone for 40 days and immediately we're off to idolatry and the golden calf. And we don't learn again with Joshua. Joshua, he's going to be the guy to lead us through into the promised land. He's our general. He's our genius military commander. He's going to take it. And that doesn't work out so well either. It seems we just cannot learn this lesson. David, Solomon, 
It's not just Jews. We have the Spartans have Lycurgus, their mythical founder who just completely writes the rules for the society and says, everybody do what I say and you're all going to be good. And they say, thank you, where do we sign? We keep going on throughout history trying to find the heroic genius who is going to lead us into the new era, who's going to make everything all right. We even have a term for this in our religion. It's called Messiah. And we continually look for this person and wait for them. And this is something that does not end in the ancient world. It goes through to the, med the medieval times and Maimonides and the way that he's treated in our community and treated to this day and the law codes that are written by Yosef Caro. And it's built upon by the Romantics who really create this idea of the lone scientist or politician or hero or genius working against everyone else to try to bring some gift to the world that only they can bring. And I think we're still there. I think we're still looking for who's going to be that charismatic, genius, heroic person who can create the iPhone and change our lives, who can do something, who can bring us, because we see there's problems in our world. It's, it's hard and it's easy to want to see a genius who can just solve it for me. You know what? Jewish revitalization, this is tough. Somebody, please, Rabbi, just, just do it for us already, okay? Or the enmity and confusion and mistrust that's swirling around in our political culture right now, and we want there to be one person that can just make it better. Vote here, and it's all going to go away, and it's all going to be fine. But this is a problem. It's a problem for a few reasons. It's a problem because it's unsustainable, as we saw with Joseph. It's a problem because genius heroism, it rarely brooks democracy. To paraphrase Weber, when you rely on one class of person or one special knowledge or one kind of thing to be your ruler, then only someone who has that knowledge or only someone who has that genius or only someone who's in that special class can be a part of the conversation about who gets to do what or be in charge or hold the leadership accountable. And that can be a little bit of a problem. It's also a problem because it lets the rest of us off the hook. We get to just sit and hang out and say, oh yeah, global warming, that seems like a problem. Somebody better get on that, you know, I, I really hope. Okay, great, please. Or whatever's going on. And, and that too can be a problem. And also it, it asks us sometimes to step in and say, oh no, no. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. I'm going to solve this. I, it's my hero moment. I'm going to be the guy. I'm going to be the girl. I'm going to do it. And that can often lead to places we don't want to go. So what's the answer? How can we get out of this hero cult that we seemingly have been in for thousands of years? So there's a story that comes to us from Christianity. But it's about Jews. And it, it comes to us from Christianity about a monastery that was out in the woods. And this monastery was starting to languish. They were starting to dwindle in their numbers. But there was a Baal Shem Tov-like character, a rabbinic miracle worker, holy man, who lived in the woods by this monastery. And as the numbers were dwindling and the vibrancy of this monastery was degrading, they, they said, you know, we've got to ask this guy. This guy is going to save us. This miracle-working rabbi, we're going to send the father abbot out to ask him, and he will save our monastery. So they go out into the woods. The father abbot looks. They find the rabbi, and the rabbi, let me tell you what's going on. Our numbers are dwindling. We're not getting as many. We're not doing so well. Please, rabbi, save us. What can we do? And the rabbi thinks for a minute, and he says, Father, I'm, I'm so sorry, but... How am I going to save you? The Messiah is among you. Like, you can do it. And, and Father Abba's like, wait, what? And the rabbi says, yeah, the Messiah is one of you. And so the Father Abbot goes back and they say, what did the rabbi say? Is he going to help us? Can he do it? And the Father Abbot says, well, he, he said that one of us is the Messiah. And they're shocked. And then they're thinking, and they're looking around and they're like, well, well, it's got to be 
Father Abbott, I mean, he's so holy and he's so amazing. Well, could be Father Cosgrove. I mean, he's the smartest guy in the Abbott. It could be, yeah, well, but, you know, uh, he's going on sabbatical. I don't know if they would do that. And, and Messiah doesn't, I don't know. And Oh, it must be Father Zuckerman. The, the, the names were just in the story, by the way. And Father Zuckerman, I mean, he's the kindest, most gentle. He's, he surely is the Messiah. And this, Well, he does like that unsavory music. I don't know, it might not be him. And they go around thinking about each and every monk and realizing what could make that person the Messiah. And what could be and who could be. And they start thinking, well, maybe it could even be me. And so, well, I better act like it if I'm going to. And so slowly but surely things at the monastery turn around and its vibrancy is increased and, it numbers, and it's known as being one of these holy and spiritual places for all to come and see. And so maybe that's one of the answers. To treat everyone like we might be the hero. And to treat ourselves and say, we all have things. We all have moments. We all have things in which we could be the genius. And we could be the hero. And so could you. And so could you. And I have a lot to learn from you as well. Perhaps that's the answer. And another answer comes to us from this very Parsha. Because when the brothers are in Canaan and the famine finally hits there, the famine hits and they're running out of food and the Torah tells us that Jacob looks at them and says, Lama titra'u, why are you looking at each other? Go get food. The rabbis disagree about what, what is he trying to say, but uh, another Italian commentary, Sforno, says what he's saying to them is that each brother was, you know, saying, wow, I'm so hungry, you better go get the food. No, you go get the food. No, no, you get the food. No, you should get the food. And Jacob is saying, Lama titra'u, why are you looking at each other? Go get the food, guys, all of you. And what happens? All 11 brothers go down and get the food together. And so maybe that's another answer to this, that we can't rely on a hero, on one person, and pin all of our hopes and dreams on that, but rather we all have to go get the food together. Because the very real problems that we're facing in our Jewish world, in our secular world, in all of the world, that yes, if there's genius out there, please, if anyone is sitting on a cure for global warming or a disease, share it with all of us, please. But really, one person can't bring us out of this. One person can't be the one to lead us to safety. We all have to go down to Egypt and get the food together. Shabbat Shalom.